People who never bought it, people who rejected the propaganda, people who resisted, people who went to prison, were against, the, were against any more wars as well. And, and so you had overwhelming opinion in this country, not just against a particular war as we had on Syria in September, but against the institution for its abolition. Uh, and there were all kinds of initiatives proposed uh, in the decade after World War I that tended to fail. Disarmament conferences recommend, uh, resulted in more armaments and more cynicism and more pessimism. Uh, initiatives to establish systems of justice uh, like the League of Nations and the World Court couldn't get past that highest of all hurdles uh, for, for all things good and decent in the world, which is not some foreign nation and is not uh, Fox News. It is the United States Senate, uh, which needs to be abolished and did then and still does. Uh, nothing, nothing worked for a decade, internationally or domestically, uh, and in part because there was this split in the peace movement. There were people who were then sometimes called isolationists, which didn't actually mean all that it implies. They didn't want to be isolated from the world. They, for the most part, didn't want things like NATO that we have developed now on steroids that, that oblige nations to join in wars with other nations. Uh, they didn't want the sort of agreements that they thought led to World War I in the first place. And then there were people who wanted new treaties by the score with every nation on earth, wanted new, uh, new systems of arbitration and, and non-aggression treaties uh, with every country on earth and who were sort of seen as the, as the European or cosmopolitan peace movement. And the, two, and the two didn't get along. And people in one camp tended to think it was very, very important that we ban alcohol and the other camp that we not ban alcohol. And, and so you, had, you had debates on that topic and other topics between people who were, who were in the peace movement together. Um, and, and, they had a, and they had formal negotiations uh, and agreements and treaties signed between the two parties of the peace movement in the United States. And they came to agreement on something. And it was something that came out of the mind of a lawyer in Chicago who, in a quintessential case of getting a few dedicated people together and having it change the world, uh, got a few friends together and created a movement to outlaw war, the, the outlawry movement. The idea being that, yes, we still have to do the disarmament. Uh, and in fact, that was where we really failed and where World War II came from. Uh, and, and we have to stop propping up horrible governments, which is also where World War II came from. Uh, but we have, to, we have to make war illicit. We have to make war illegal. We have to stop treating war as neutral, like the weather, which is how it was treated up through World War I. It wasn't illegal. It wasn't illegal to seize territory. To, to attack another nation. It was just what happened. Uh, and you could punish certain tactics and abuses and outrages uh, during the course of a war, but you couldn't punish war making. And it wasn't punished at the end of World War I or any previous war. Uh, and, and so the idea was put forward, let's have a treaty that abolishes war by, by law. And then we'll have to establish systems of, of, of international law and, and arbitration and settlement of disputes uh, and prosecution and disarmament. You know, we aren't going to actually end war in a day, but this is going to be an important step. And generations are going to have to continue this forward. These are, this was people who thought in terms of generations, a generational struggle to, to end slavery, to get women the vote and, and so forth. Uh, if blood feuds could be ended, if dueling could be ended, if horrible treatments of, of criminals uh, convicted could be ended. Why couldn't war be ended? It was next to be ended. This was the thinking in the 20s. Andrew Carnegie you know, got all his money from a war and then created a board that was required to spend all his money ending war and then have a meeting and decide what is the second worst thing on earth and start ending that. Uh, now, the Carnegie Endowment for Peace is, has moved on to everything but ending war uh, illegally and against the will of the guy who put up the money who's now dead. But this is how people thought uh, and institutions were established and created. And in this movement of the 1920s, 
was the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, was every peace organization still around that was around then, plus the American Legion, the Parents and Teachers Association, the, the, the every religious group in the country. This was a peace movement led by university presidents and lawyers and Republican bankers, and uh, it, it was as mainstream as you could get. Everybody was for abolishing war, really, truly for abolishing. And, and you know, the odds were not the same. The military-industrial complex was not what it is, what it has been since World War II. And it was not treasonous to oppose war the way it has been since World War II. You know, now there, there's a school board member where I live who we asked to support a, a International Day of Peace one September, and he said, I, I want to sign on, I want to be for peace, but I don't want anyone to think I'm against any wars. And, and that has been the approach since World War II, largely, and growing. Before World War II, it wasn't, uh, and the farmers wanted the backward Europeans who dragged this country into a war to buy more grain and fewer weapons. And they had more pull in Washington than the weapons makers. So it was a different world, but it was also a world in which people dared to think more drastically, more radically, uh, and, and more optimistically about what could be done. Uh, and, and so they, uh, they put this treaty uh, into play. They, uh, a, a peace activist uh, from Columbia University went over to France and drafted a statement for the French foreign minister, a guy named Briand, sent it to newspapers. Nothing happened. Uh, a colleague wrote a, wrote a column in the New York Times replying, saying, why has nothing happened? They did this sort of ventriloquist act on behalf of these two countries and some illegal diplomacy until uh, there was pressure built for a treaty between France and the United States to ban war, to, to, to criminalize any war making of any sort. Uh, and the Secretary of State in the United States, a guy named Kellogg, was absolutely uh, against it. You know, cursed peace activists had no interest in them, had never been on the side of peace. But the pressure built uh, over a period of months in 1927 intensely countless meetings and media and petitions and lobbying uh, and women's groups who had sold out on World War I but now had the right to vote and were going to use it, damn it, and went to Washington by the thousands and the leader of, of which had a heart attack during the process and just the, the intensity of the push that this Secretary of State went in, in six months or so from cursing the peace activists to telling his wife he thought maybe he could get the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, and, he, and he did, and he got it, and he deserved it. And, and, and so he wanted, he wanted the attempt made and then drop it. The French foreign minister wanted a treaty between the two nations that, uh, that would oblige the United States to jump into any war France was in. Uh, but, the, but the peace movement wanted a universal treaty for the world. And they, and they got it, uh, and they got it by pressuring those two governments and every other. And on August 27th, 1928, uh, in Paris, France, uh, the event happened that uh, matches what was described in the 1950s, 1950 song, uh, Last Night I Had the Strangest Dream, uh, in which men, and it was all men, and the women were out front protesting, men got together in a room and signed papers that said, there will be no more war, uh, and it was it was dozens of nations, and many of which were recognizing the existence uh, of uh, of the Soviet Union for the first time. France was recognizing Germany formally for the first time. That flags of all these nations were flying, uh, and it was the single biggest news story of 1928. And war was banned forever. And Secretary <laughs> Kellogg got the peace prize, and Briand had already gotten the peace prize, and the, the Kellogg-Briand Treaty was put on the books. And then seizing territory was not legal anymore, and nations gave territory back, wars were prevented, wars were halted, war was, was frowned upon, and war was looked down on for years. But pressure kept building for World War II, and Western governments were supporting horrible governments in Germany and Italy, and the armaments were, were continuing. Uh, and people were talking about the need for defensive wars. Uh, and 
and World War II came. But at the end of World War II, Franklin Roosevelt pulled out the Kellogg-Briand Treaty and said, let's prosecute the losers for the crime of making war, which had never happened before. And from that day to this, we haven't yet had World War III. We haven't yet had the armed, powerful nations of the world go to war again. We've had them make endless wars on the poor nations of the world, uh, which is a problem many people have a hard time seeing and that I do not want to minimize. And yet, because World War II happened, people dismissed the Kellogg-Briand Treaty, which is still on the books. 85 some nations are signed on to it. It bans all war. They dismiss it as irrelevant because it was put on the books before World War II happened. It's as if we banned drunk driving, and the first guy who drove drunk, we said, well, we're going to have to tear that law up. You know? No, <laughs> I mean, this is a very effective prosecution. Nuremberg and Tokyo, albeit one-sided. Uh, so so the, the reason I wrote that book is in part to tell people there are laws on our side. You know, when they want to legalize torture, when they want to legalize campaign bribery, when they want to legalize war, they pull out marginal notes on federal court proceedings and vetoes that were overridden and all sorts of previous speeches by the same guy. You know, stuff that's not laws. If we wanted full employment, if we wanted full peace, I mean, we have laws on our side that we don't bother to hold up because we don't own any television networks. But we're going to have to start because we have more power than we think. But the other reason I wrote the book was to examine the, the attitudes and approaches of the peace movement of the 1920s, which I think we have to get back to. Um, so the other book that I was asked to, to speak about and that I brought uh, is called War No More, The Case for Abolition. The idea that war is inevitable it is just false. It's, it's ridiculously common. Uh, it's, I don't know if it's just the defeatist attitude of, of activists or of people who've grown up in a society that treats permanent war as the norm, uh, but it is, it, it is particularly prevalent in this country. Uh, and I, I think as much so or more so than in some countries where war is actually happening. You know, our, our wars don't, U.S. wars don't happen in the U.S. Um, but there is this belief. Well, anthropologists have gone to societies uh, and spoken to men and asked them why, when you have that bow and arrow for hunting, do you not shoot it at slave raiders who are coming to it? The world is on to the fact that the United States is generating the violence. The United States is not on to it yet. We're, we're on to the fact that these wars are very bad ideas. People turned against Iraq and Afghanistan after a year and a half in each case, said never should have done that. Kept saying for years and years, never should have done that as the wars continued. Never supported Libya, were ignored, didn't support, had rejected every time there's been a proposal for a war on Iran. When this sanctions bill was understood, not as an alternative to war, but as a step toward war, rejected it and rejected those missiles into Syria. But people are not ready to reject the enterprise, to reject the military-industrial complex. Um, and that's where we have to get to. We have to understand that preparation is not defensive. Most of the weapons, including the weapons made here, have no defensive purpose. They're offensive weapons. You, you could cut 90% of the U.S. military and that spending you could take $900 billion out of that trillion and do something else with it and have what's left be the defensive bit of the Defense Department. You could have a Coast Guard, you could have a National Guard, you could have anti-aircraft missiles. This could be a step for people who can't wrap their minds around better means of defense yet. You could get rid of 90% of U.S. military spending without talking anybody out of war yet as a step in that direction. And you could take that $900 billion and you could take part of it, take a little fraction of it, you could take $50 billion, end starvation worldwide, give clean water to everyone worldwide, take a little bit more, start giving countries schools and hospitals. This country would be the most beloved, not the most hated, right? For, for a fraction of what's spent on militarism. Cut taxes dramatically for working people, great. Give this country the best 
energy system and infrastructure and education system in the world and start giving the rest of the world some of the same. And you have money left over. You're trying to figure out what to do with it. A trillion dollars is a heck of a lot of money. And, and so putting it into making ourselves less safe is not defensive. Uh, it's not necessary. Then you have third of the three categories of myths. The idea that war is beneficial, that it does something good. There have been polls up until recently, I don't know if they're still doing them, a majority of Americans think Iraqis benefited from the war that destroyed Iraq, destroyed that country. They think they benefited and they think they're, and a, a strong plurality think they're grateful. Not that they should be grateful, that they are grateful. Now the only polls done of Iraqis, they say they were better off. Under the horrible government of Saddam Hussein, they were better off. So this is a level of arrogance from above the bombs. We can tell you that against your own understanding, we know better than you that you are better off having had your, your nation destroyed. Uh, you know, so that myth has to be confronted with facts. Most of these are questions of facts, not ideology, of getting people to see information that they don't want to be made aware of. Um, war doesn't bring stability. War doesn't benefit the aggressor nation. You know, they, we, we all know people who work for the war machine, and we don't want to throw them out of work. But they could have more jobs and better paying jobs with the money spent otherwise. In fact, even tax cuts for working people produces more jobs than military spending. So it's worse than nothing, as one might expect from something so destructive. It's a drain on the economy. So the, the disgusting idea that we need to kill all of these people around the world for our jobs, for our economy, for our lifestyle, isn't even true. It doesn't even work that way. Uh, you know, People think that, well, even though it's a drain on our economy, it allows all of our corporations to exploit the rest of the world. And that we, 5%, use a third of, of all of these minerals and resources. We don't need that for our lifestyle. We could have a better lifestyle with less consumption and less destruction. Uh, and it is possible to buy things from people without bombing them uh, as well. It's, it's, there's, there's lies upon lies. Um, so then there's a, there's a section of this website and of this argument that looks at not the myths in favor of war, but the case against war. Uh, and the, the case that I think is most missing from arguments made by the peace movement today is, is the moral one which was the most prominent in the 20s and 30s. War is distinguished by liberal humanitarians from genocide. We need war because there's, there are evil things in the world, and those evil things are genocide. We, we constantly hear about dictators killing their own people. You know, as it's perfectly okay to kill somebody else's people, but you kill your own people, and damn it, we're not gonna stand for that, we're gonna bomb some more of your people. Well, in these wars, well over 90%, possibly 99% in the case of recent wars in Iraq and elsewhere, are on one side. And the vast majority are civilian by anybody's definition. I, I think there's, some, there's a problem with the very distinction between civilian and militant here, but by anybody's definition of civilian, they're almost all civilian, they're almost all on one side. And they're the complete range from grandparents to infants. So the distinction between that and genocide is a subtle one at best. And when you look at how the militarism and the weapon sales and the wars generate the genocides, forget about the distinction. These, these are cousins, war and genocide. They are the worst thing we've produced. And when we try to make war seem to be something done by anyone other than the greatest purveyor of violence on earth, which is what Dr. King called the U.S. government, then we're, we're missing the picture and we're excusing what is a danger that, uh, that threatens our very existence. Um, and, and I don't think that most people in this country support one-sided slaughters. I think they avoid knowing that that's what these wars are. If you ask Americans who died in Iraq, what percentage were Americans, what percentage were Iraqis, they, they don't get it, they're nowhere close. They think it's about even or more Americans died which is what you would think from reading the lists of the dead in the U.S. newspapers. They're all Americans. You know, so I, I think people have to be told this information. 
uh, and they won't want to accept it, and you have to tell them eight times, so it's not just a question of facts, but if people knew, they wouldn't support it. Um, war endangers us. War provokes threats. War provokes war. Uh, and the weapons that are now proliferating threaten our very existence. Uh, a, a war with Iran threatens to escalate into a nuclear war that threatens our very existence. Uh, the, the risk is enough that we ought to abolish war entirely for that reason alone. War also threatens our natural environment. Wars are not just fought for fossil fuels. Wars don't just convince young people that oil and gas are macho and, and solar and wind are for wimps. Wars are fought with fossil fuels. The Middle East became the focus to be dominated so that the British could fuel their navy, not so that their navy could fight over the oil for some other purpose. During some of the wars of the occupation of Iraq, the majority of petroleum consumed on Earth was consumed in Iraq. The greatest consu consumer of petroleum we have is the US military. It would rank number 30 something if it were a nation in terms of consumption of petroleum. Uh, it is the creator of, of Superfund sites in this country, the destroyer of the natural environment, the uh, eliminator of life on islands like Vieques and soon to be Pagan Island uh, in the Marianas and others. It, 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 is, it is pulling teeth to get big environmental organizations to oppose militarism. You can get them to start opposing what's being done to Jeju Island or what's being done on Pagan Island. But getting that next step, we have to start with the local. Get, get your local Sierra Club on board with World Beyond War. And when enough of them get on board, the, the national will. Uh, because until we can talk environmental groups into opposing the greatest destroyer of the environment we have, they will be handicapped and the peace movement will be handicapped and the other movements that all need to work together will be handicapped. The same goes for the civil liberties groups that are against torture and imprisonment and assassination but not military spending, which on a graph goes up right along with its consequences. So we, we have to start looking at the, at the disease here rather than just the symptoms and the environment is a, is a good case of that. Um, civil liberties I, I just touched on. Uh, the fact that war impoverishes us rather than enriching us, I've touched on and we can talk about. Um, the trillion dollars a year is doubled if you look at the rest of the globe. So as a species, we're putting some $2 trillion a year into militarism. Uh, and it's not going away. It's not dying off. There, there are some academics, and they are mostly people who view war as a non-Western deficiency, uh, who make the case that war is going away on its own. And if we would just sit back and relax, it would be gone, and, and there's nothing to worry about. And this is dangerously false. There are forms of violence that seem to be diminishing. War is not one of them. War is one of them if you fudge the numbers. If you redefine wars as civil wars and call that something else when George Bush declares mission accomplished on a ship off San Diego. The war's going away if you, uh, if you calculate the deaths in comparison to the global population rather than the population of the country where the war is and so forth. If you, if you monkey with the numbers, you can try to make a case that war is going away. Uh, but if you look at the greatest maker of war on earth, our country, popular opinion is turning against war. Uh, and that's not the result of a few days work back in September in the Syrian missile crisis. It's a result of a decade and of decades of work, uh, but it has a long way to go. And even with public opinion on our side, war doesn't stop if the government doesn't listen to us, as the government doesn't listen to us unless forced to on anything. So we said no to the missiles, and that was made a big public question on our televisions, and they listened to us and other factors. Uh, we didn't want the guns to go in either, and the guns went right ahead and went in. We wanted humanitarian aid, and we didn't get it. Uh, 
if you give people a, a serious survey where you show them what the federal budget is, because they have no idea that, that half the federal budget uh, goes to militarism. Uh, people think a quarter of the federal budget goes to humanitarian aid. I mean, this is, this is how far off people are. But if you show them what the budget is, they want to move a big chunk away from the military. But we don't have the power yet to create a question, even when we have the right answer. You know, when, when Syria was made a question, we gave the right answer. But it was made a question by the governments and the, and the corporate media, uh, and uh, public pressure was only one factor in creating that question. So we have to we have to move people in the direction of understanding what could be done with two trillion dollars. You know, there is no reason that education or health care or housing or a sustainable environmental energy policy uh, and infrastructure should be anything but a human right here and everywhere else. The government spends enough trying to make college affordable to make college free. Just doesn't spend the money right. Spends more than enough to give everybody health care from birth to death, but doesn't spend it right. Wastes the money. But on other things, doesn't want to spend the money and has it. And has it and creates another myth, which is that we're broke. We're not broke. We're rolling in money. We're just producing the wrong things with it. So we, we have to, and the, the, the third part of the website is about what we do and how we end all war. And it involves building the institutions to avoid crises and to handle crises by other, more effective, less violent tools, uh, and creating a, uh, a movement that people can join in and build this pressure uh, in cooperation around the globe. So. Tools, tools that get us out of this hammer nail syndrome, where everything looks like a nail because all we have is the hammer of war. Uh, tools for conversion, as Bruce was mentioning, a, a committee uh, like has been created in Connecticut needs to be created and advanced in every state. Um, disarmament, steps toward diplomacy before crises are created. Uh, reformation or replacement of institutions like the UN and the International Criminal Court for Africans. It needs to be an international criminal court for everybody. Um, so we need education, we need access to accurate information, we need to build a coalition that can advance these things. We need all the steps from cultural exchange to anti-racism to bans on particular weapons and bans on foreign weapon sales and foreign occupations. Uh, we need to, to confront nationalism, and there's an endless list of, of useful steps that can contribute to this that I could show you on a slide, but you can see at worldbeyondwar.org uh, where there is a resource center with cards and flyers and graphics and videos and presentations that can be made to work, I promise, and, uh, and a declaration of peace that I hope many of you have just signed on cards that have been passed around. Uh, and if so, you are joining with thousands of people from dozens of nations around the globe saying, I'm ready to work not just against Republican wars, not just against the bad wars, but against all war. Uh, and there are going to be a lot of people making a lot of noise this summer about the century mark since the start of World War I. There is no better opportunity to say to the world, it doesn't work. The war to end all war, we've been trying it for a century, and it brings more war. And it's time to try something else. Uh, and, and that's what I hope we can all work together to advance in Maine, in collaboration with not the rest of this country, but the rest of the world. Um, thank you very, very much for inviting me.